The Southwest Missouri State University Department of Geography Geology presents Land and Life in the Ozarks. This course is one of several units of study offered in Ozark Regional Studies at SMSU and is designed to enhance appreciation of the cultural heritage of this region. In the lecture today, I'll be continuing with the discussion of the settlement of the Ozarks, and this lecture should complete uh, that coverage. I'll be talking about the settlement of the interior Ozarks, the Springfield Plain, and the Boston Mountains. Uh, I'll uh, touch on the matter of uh, uh, settlement ecology, that is the factors that went into the uh, selection of the sites, of specific sites of settlement by the early pioneers. And then we'll turn to the discussion of the ethnic and minority groups that settled the Ozarks. I think a place to, or a beginning point might be to talk about the Springfield Plain or the western section of the Ozarks. Uh, the Springfield Plain was settled late uh, compared to the northern and western borders of the Ozarks uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, first, it was to the west of the rough and rugged interior sections of the Ozarks, which were not easily traveled through. Uh, the area did not have nav navigable rivers. Uh, the region was basically, uh, or uh, there were much larger areas of the area of the Springfield Plain that uh, were in prairie and consequent, consequently were not considered to be as uh, favorable areas to settle. And although the Springfield Plain did have uh, a great wealth of um, minerals in the form of lead and zinc, these were not widely known until after 1850. Well, the routes to the Springfield Plain uh, were uh, several. Now, I think it might be well for us to look at a map of the United States and to simply point out how the settlers moved to the uh, western portions of the Ozarks and the interior sections of the Ozarks. Uh, many of them entered by way of the White River. Uh, in fact, uh, if, if we look at a map of the United States uh, and the region, the Ozark region, uh, the White River route was a favorite route into the uh, interior because <clears throat> from the White River they could uh, go up uh, the Black River and the Current River and penetrate to the interior sections of the Ozarks. In fact, uh, Schoolcraft, when he visited the uh, White River country in Missouri in 1818, found settlers already established there. And in a very early set settlement on the James River, just uh, south of Springfield, was made in 1822 by settlers from Ohio. And if we could uh, simply go back to Ohio, uh, if the camera can follow me back here, these settlers uh, set out, they lived along the Muskingum, Muskingum River in eastern Ohio, they came down this river, uh, followed the Ohio uh, down to its mouth, uh, followed the Mississippi south to the mouth of the uh, Arkansas, up uh, then the White River, uh, and finally to the James and settled in the northern part of Stone County. Another uh, favorite route to the uh, Ozarks was by way of what was known as the Ridge Road. The Ridge Road uh, uh, followed essentially the drainage divide uh, that uh, uh, was, is now followed by Interstate 44 between St. Louis and Springfield and on to the uh, southwest. Uh, there were branches, branches of this road that uh, came in from St. Genevieve and Cape Girardeau. Uh, the, these roads joined at Caledonia in the Bellevue Valley and then through Steelville and finally joined the Ridge Road at uh, St. James. Uh, Boonville and Warsaw were cities uh, on the rivers that were navigable and they were the major entrepots for uh, not only uh, shipment of goods but also for the entry of settlers to the western section of the Ozarks. Actually there were two cycles of immigration to the Ozarks. Uh, the, there's a one phase was what we might call the pre-railroad phase uh, or pre-Civil uh, War phase uh, since railroads were mainly built after the Civil War. And <clears throat> during this phase that primarily Tennesseans, Kentuckians, and people from North Carolina uh, came into the Ozarks. After the Civil War and when after the railroads were built, uh, we see uh, that there were a large, larger numbers of people from the Middle Western states, those states north of the Ohio River. If I could look at the first slide then, if we could, uh, 
this slide shows the nativity of Missouri's population in 1860 and 1890. The top maps uh, show the population in 1860. If you look at the map in the upper left part of your screen, uh, the arrows indicate the states or, uh, from which the uh, immigrants came in 1860, or by 1860. And although you can't read the figures there, I'll simply give you the statistics. The leading states were Kentucky, uh, with 99,000 immigrants uh, uh, and over, then Tennessee, Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. It, by 1890, the picture had changed, and by this time, railroads, of course, had been built not only uh, throughout the Ozarks, but in the rest of Missouri as well. Uh, the leading states in this case are uh, Illinois, Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, and Tennessee. So the source of origin of the uh, settlers had changed uh, considerably. The uh, resources that attracted settlement uh, to the interior Ozarks were the mineral resources, uh, the uh, timber that was there, and also uh, good ag or the, what ag good agricultural land there was to be found. Uh, I'll simply touch on these uh, briefly because we'll be talking about each one of these with a separate lecture later on in the course. I've prepared a map which I think is, will point out some of the early locations that people uh, uh, entered for purposes of exploiting the timber resources and the uh, mineral resources. If you can come in very close with the camera, uh, here in Wright County, some of the first uh, timber, or at least the first uh, recorded exploitation of timber occurred here in Wright County on the headwaters of the Gasconade River. Schoolcraft, who was a naturalist, traveled through the Ozarks in 1818-1819, and he visited the uh, lumber mills that were located here. They floated pine timber down the Gasconade to the Missouri and uh, then to St. Louis. It was the closest source of pine timber for the building of St. Louis. Uh, close by, uh, Wright County in Texas County in 1823, there were six sawmills reported operating there, and this is uh, near the center of the Ozarks. The pineries in Ozark County were opened or being exploited by 1850. Uh, pineries is the local name given to the pine uh, forests of the Ozark region, and by 1867 there were sawmills operating on the along the current river in Carter County. Mining also was carried out at a very early time. Schoolcraft talked about the mines that operated in the caves along the Gasconade. They mined batgano from which they could leach saltpeter. The saltpeter then was mixed with sulfur and uh, uh, charcoal to manufacture gunpowder, an essential commodity on the frontier. Other early mining activities were carried out uh, in the iron mines at Stouts Creek uh, in Iron County. The Springfield Furnace uh, used local ores by 1823 in Washington County, and Massey's Iron Work at Merrimack Spring was opened in 1826, and several other ore deposits were opened in Dent and Crawford County close by. Uh, later, of course, the large lead and zinc deposits in the Tri-State District were opened up. The first strike was at Granby in 1850. Well, agriculture uh, really was the uh, major uh, source of, uh, or attraction resource that the people were uh, interested in, and they were looking for good soils, good land on which to settle, and especially navigable rivers, and, uh, because this was a way that uh, their commodities could be shipped out. Now, there was really a process of natural selection uh, the wealthier farmers uh, settled along the Missouri and Mississippi River borders, and the cheaper lands in, in, in the interior were left to uh, people who could afford them. The land in the Missouri Valley in the 1830s uh, cost from uh, 3 to $5 an acre, which was beyond the means of everyone except the Kentucky and North Carolina um, planter who uh, raised hemp and tobacco and, and even attempted to raise cotton. Uh, 
so the, the people who immigrated to the Ozarks were of a mixed group. And if we could look at the next slide, uh, we see a picture here of Daniel Boone, who represents the frontier type, who was always looking for uh, new land, uh, partly because uh, they uh, often couldn't find a secure title to the land that they had in the east. In the next slide, we see uh, descendants, perhaps, of the yeoman farmer, the poor farmer who settled in the interior districts of the Ozarks because the land that could be had there was cheaper. And in the next slide, we see uh, the, the tomb of Mosen, Moses Austin at Potosi. Austin represented an entirely different type of person, uh, one with uh, talents, skills, and also money. And uh, these people usually uh, located in the in where there was uh, mine, uh, mining activity or <clears throat> where there were good soils on which uh, plantation agriculture could be carried out. Uh, the settlement progressed pretty much uh, uh, into the uh, valleys, that is, uh, along the larger valleys, then to the smaller valleys. And if we can look at the next slide, uh, we see um, a, a, in a, a representative example of the, the people who settled into some of these smaller valleys, a small cemetery. Uh, here, uh, the person immigrated from Kentucky. And in the next slide, in the, in the same cemetery, a uh, person who immigrated from Tennessee. And the name indicates a, a probably of a Scotch-Irish descent. Then if we can look at the next uh, uh, slide, uh, here we see a section of the uh, <clears throat> what is uh, of Shannon County along the Jacks Fork River it shows uh, the sites that were actually uh, claimed and cleared. And you see that it was almost all these clearings were in the river valleys, uh, in the dark spots representing the areas that are cleared out. In the next slide, we see uh, almost the same thing. Uh, it shows the land that was preempted uh, between 1820 and 1857 uh, in, uh, along the current river and its tributaries. And again, you see that the dark areas that represent uh, land that was uh, preempted, and almost all of it is located in the river valleys. So the progression of settlement really was from the valleys uh, to the uplands. And uh, with the strong uh, emphasis on uh, Tennesseans who took up the interior areas, uh, actually much, much of the upland land was not settled uh, until after the Graduation Act, which uh, uh, hinged the price of land on how long it had been on the market. Uh, the, prior to the Graduation Act in 1854, the land sold for $1.25 an acre, which was considered to be too high for the rough interior districts of the Ozarks, particularly the upland areas. And after 1854, then uh, thousands of thousands of Ozark acres sold for 12 and a half cents to 25 cents an acre. And then during this time then, much of the land was taken up. Uh, I'd like then to look at a, if you could look at a poster here uh, that was prepared by Dr. Clendenin. I think it's an interesting map. Uh, he used the manuscript census to show the origin of the settlers in the uh, Curtois Hills and also in the uh, White River Hills and Boston Mountains in the interior Ozarks between 1820 and 1840, and it does show that the interior districts were settled very heavily from people from Tennessee. These dots represent the origin of these families. Each dot represents a family, and this, these dots over here represent uh, where the families settled. You can see that they did move down the Tennessee River, the Cumberland River, the Ohio River, and then uh, moved up the various rivers, uh, jumping off from places like St. Louis and St. Genevieve and Cape Girardeau to settle these rugged interior districts of the Ozarks. So the interior Ozarks does have a very strong uh, heritage, or what we would call a Tennessee heritage. Uh, then apparently uh, alluvial soils uh, were the attraction, and also springs. And if we can, uh, I'd like to look next at another poster, which will uh, show uh, the settlement ecology, and if we can come in very close on these posters, these are actual settlements that were made in the southern Curtois Hills, and <clears throat> they do show where the sites of the farmsteads were uh, situated. Uh, this is on Dry Valley, 
this represents a house, uh, a well. There was no spring in this particular location. Uh, this represents a clearing, uh, an orchard, a barn, and a small outbuilding, the rest of the area being entirely timbered. So they were located in the valley where there were some alluvial soils. Here's another actual settlement on, uh, in this case, the, the settlement is on the Black River, and uh, the house is located close by a spring. This is a spring here that flows into the Black River. There's an orchard, a cleared area here, and a larger cleared area here. Very often these sites were selected where there was a tributary stream coming in because there would be more alluvial soil. A barn here and a barn here. Uh, then if we can go to this one here, this is on Sinking Creek, a tributary of the Jack's Fork, and we find, uh, again, the house located close to the spring, uh, a barn here, two clearings along the creek, an orchard, another spring down, down the uh, valley a ways, and a sawmill. And then uh, they would move back into the smaller branches. This final uh, uh, site represents a farm in which the farmhouse is built up on the side of the hill in the timber. Uh, they have a cleared land area of cleared space up on the ridge itself. There is a spring on the side of the hill, a spring house located down, uh, down slope, and then also some cleared land in the valley and an orchard on the side of the hill. Well, uh, from these diagrams, I think it shows that the presence of water and alluvial soil was certainly important in the settlement of the interior Ozarks. Well, so much for the settlement of the interior Ozarks. Uh, I'd like next to turn to the uh, discussion of the first of the ethnic groups that settled in the Ozarks, and certainly the most important one, and this uh, uh, always the most important one the, would be the German settlement. The Germans uh, <clears throat> were attracted to the region uh, because that, uh, the, particularly the northern and eastern borders of the region, because of the uh, types of soil that were there and the, the similarity of the um, climate and uh, resources to the to the sections of Germany from which they came. One of the first settlements, uh, and, and some of, most of the Germans did not, by the way, come in as pioneers. Most of them came in after the area had been opened up uh, pretty well and purchased uh, land, uh, perhaps the land that had left, been left behind that was still fairly cheap. But there was one immigrant group. I have prepared a, a map, and I think we'll turn to this map, which shows these early immigrant groups, and the one that uh, was contemporary with the very first Americans was a settlement on the Whitewater uh, River. These uh, are referred to as the Whitewater Dutch. They located near Burfordville in uh, Cape Girardeau County. They settled there in 1897, excuse me, 1797, uh, which was uh, contemporary with the very earliest American settlements. They lost their language and uh, culture fairly, mu fairly much because they uh, did not have direct contact with Germany or with other German groups. They came from North Carolina. Uh, very soon then, Germans uh, immigrated to uh, the northern Ozark border along the uh, Missouri River. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, Gottfried Duden, who lived here in Warren County uh, in 1824 and 18, 1825, wrote a book called A Trip Through the Western States in which he spoke of this area as being uh, ideal for settlement. And just a few years later, in fact, in 1832, uh, there were families located in the Boone's Lick country, some 20 German families. And in the same year, there were uh, German families located at Dutzau, some 32 of them. Uh, the following year, a Catholic Germans located at Westphalia in Osage County, and a number of other Catholic German settlements uh, soon followed after that. Uh, by 1838, Washington, Missouri was founded in this case by an immigration society in Berlin. And uh, in the same year, Herman uh, was founded by an immigration society from Philadelphia. And Herman soon became the cultural capital of what was to become the, what, what is sometimes referred to as the Missouri Rhineland, where uh, this region here, which was heavily settled by Germans. And if we could look at the next slide, uh, we see the uh, German school that was founded there. And, of course, they did retain their culture by uh, having their own schools in which the language was preserved. Now, if we can come back to the map and look at the settlements on the eastern Ozark border, that is, the German settlements, we find that uh, 
Uh, Cape Girardeau was founded, uh, or settled, I should say, uh, by Germans uh, in uh, 1833. Americans had, of course, been there for some 35 years earlier. Uh, a Dutch town was settled by French, uh, excuse me, Swiss Germans, uh, uh, Swiss who spoke German in 1836, and then uh, Protestant Germans settled in Perry County at Altenburg, uh, Wittenberg, and Frona, and these people uh, settled in very compact uh, villages in order to preserve their religious and cultural identity. Catholic Germans were also attracted to St. Genevieve County uh, in, in 1840, Zell and New Offenburg was fo were founded uh, close by uh, St. Genevieve, which was already a well-established Catholic community. And very soon, St. Genevieve County actually had a German-speaking uh, majority in their population. Now, the German immigrants, as I said, were attracted to the uh, northern and eastern borders of the Ozarks primarily because of the navigable rivers which enabled them to um, communicate with New Orleans and uh, through New Orleans with Germany as well. Uh, they were uh, very successful at farming the Loessel soils, and uh, there were plenty of those, and the Americans had avoided them somewhat. Uh, the, the general progression of settlement was that the Germans would take over the cheaper land, and being uh, thrifty farmers and uh, fairly successful farmers, particularly on those uh, hill soils, they were able to acquire uh, enough wealth that they could purchase the better alluvial soils in the bottomlands and gradually then they displaced the Americans who had come prior to the Germans. Uh, if we could look again at a map of settlement, this map is prepared, was prepared by uh, uh, Dr. Gerlach and it does show the large extensive area of German settlement uh, outlined here in orange along the northern Ozark, Ozark border and in 1870, perhaps a fourth of the population was German. Uh, also, on the eastern Ozark border, uh, a similar uh, numbers of Germans. Now, also on this map, we see outlined in, with the dashed line are areas uh, in which railroads became important in bringing in immigrant groups. Uh, here, this represents the old Atlantic and Pacific route between St. Louis and Springfield, later the Frisco, and also the Frisco in the uh, southeastern section of the Ozarks. There were, uh, just to enumerate these very quickly, Swede, several Swedish colonies, or Danish colonies, a number of German colonies uh, scattered throughout the Ozarks, but especially along the railroads, or German settlements in, uh, down in the southwestern part of, or south and west of Springfield. Uh, there were Austrian settlements. Uh, Italian, there was an Italian colony at uh, Rosati, uh, which is still uh, in existence, and in uh, near Tawny Town, or at Tawny Town, in Arkansas, northwest Arkansas, another Italian colony. Both of these uh, engaged in uh, the raising of uh, grapes extensively. Uh, there were also Moravian settlements, uh, Bohe Bohemian settlements, a Polish settlement, uh, and if we look here in the southeastern Ozarks, uh, Yugoslavs and Hungarians. Certainly the railroads did play an important part in adding a good deal of ethnic diversity to the um, uh, Ozarks. Now if we can turn from the uh, European uh, immigrants to the Ozarks and uh, turn then to the, the next ethnic group, which would be the Indians, in this case the Cherokees, who immigrated to the Ozarks, uh, a few voluntarily, but most of them were removed from the eastern states. Their homes were in Georgia and Tennessee. Uh, they after the policy of removal was established in 1825 and when the treaty was signed to, in which their lands were uh, appropriated, they, some, I guess approximately a thousand, uh, Dr. Lightfoot in his article on the uh, Trail of Tears mentions a thousand, approximately a thousand uh, uh, Indians did migrate or voluntarily remove themselves to uh, what, what was the Oklahoma Ozarks. Uh, the big removal came in 1838. Uh, Lightfoot in his uh, <coughs> article uh, mentions that in 1829, which was the year before the treaty was signed, that the Cherokees in the East numbered some 15,000 persons. Uh, they owned 22,000 cattle, uh, had 1,300 slaves. They were slave owners. 
He had 2,000 spinning wheels, 700 looms, 31 grist mills, uh, 10 sawmills, 8 cotton gins, 18 schools. Uh, they had an alphabet. Uh, many were Christians, uh, they, and they published a newspaper, the Cherokee Phoenix. In 1838, uh, some 12,000 Cherokees then were uh, rounded up and uh, uh, in preparation to be moved to the West. And at that time, then the Indians themselves, the ch principal chief, John Ross, petitioned the government to allow the Indians to remove themselves to the Oklahoma Ozarks. And th this they did during a very severe winter in which some 3,000 Cherokees lost their lives during the move, partly because they were very poorly provisioned. Uh, in the next series of slides, we'll look at some of the people and uh, uh, the Cherokees that uh, were important in, the, in this event and the mo removal to the West. The man you're looking at here was, is uh, John Ross, who was the principal chief. He doesn't look very Indian, and he wasn't. In fact, only about uh, one-eighth uh, Cherokee. But he was the principal chief. The, this picture you're looking at now uh, is uh, Major Ridge, who was a uh, one of the principal chiefs who signed the treaty of removal and lost his life because of it. He was assassinated because of it. The next slide shows his son, uh, John Ridge, also an important and uh, fairly wealthy man among the Cherokees. In the next picture, we see the Cherokee alphabet, which was developed by Sequoia, uh, one of the leaders of the Cherokee nation. And in the next picture, we see one of the homes that they left. And many of, the, many of them, of course, were quite well to do. In the next picture, we see uh, the home of uh, Major Ridge, which is quite an elegant home at Rome, Georgia. And this he had to give up in his move to the west. And then in the next picture, we see a uh, uh, land uh, allotment in which they uh, drew for the lands. And in this case, it was John Ridge's land that was taken. Uh, the discovery of gold in, on the Cherokee lands in Georgia sealed their fate. In the next picture, we see a view of the uh, Trail of Tears, the people moving across to, uh, from the Tennessee River by way of Nashville, crossing the Ohio near Paducah, uh, crossing the uh, uh, Mississippi uh, above uh, Cape Girardeau, uh, immigrating uh, by way of Caledonia, Steelville, and then the Ridge Road through and near Springfield uh, to uh, Oklahoma. Actually, there were several routes followed because they often uh, did uh, look for uh, much of their sustenance from the, from the wild game that was about. This concludes our presentation on the uh, settlement of the Ozarks, and uh, we'll have our midterm exam on March the 6th in Temple Hall, L102 at 10 o'clock. You should expect about 60 objective questions. The test will cover through this lecture and through chapter 7 in the text. <laughs>